and welcome to Adawa's workshop series. I am super excited to be here and teach you about the business model canvas. But first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Carla Briones, and I'm actually originally from Mexico. Um, I have always, always loved business and coming up with new business ideas. Um, and since, um, since I'm a lover of business, I ended up opening quite a few businesses of my own. I have currently four different types of business in retail, in the food and beverage industry, e-commerce, so on and so forth. But my love is to help um, uh, underrepresented entrepreneurs build and grow their businesses, which is what brings me to Adawe in, uh, in, at this capacity. And I'm super excited to be here and to um, teach you about business model uh, planning in uh, in your canvas. So this is what you're going to be learning today. You're going to learn how to draft your business model canvas. And I'm going to give you a tip. It's basically nine elements to this canvas. So there are going to be nine different squares and a business model canvas actually um, looks like this. And you should be able to access actually this template, the canvas, in the workbook. There's going to be a workbook, uh, um, you know, accompanying this um, this recorded session. Uh, my recommendation would be to either print. Actually, it would be to print <laughs> the um, the workbook so that you're able to follow along the session and you're able to fill in the blanks as I'm explaining all of the sections of the business model canvas. So a business model canvas is different from a business plan. A business plan usually tends to be a pretty hefty document that a lot of funding and financing institutions are going to ask you for. The business model canvas is the summarized version of that business plan. And it's usually, as I mentioned, a one page document with nine different squares and nine different components. So I am actually gonna go through each of those squares um, so that you're able to see what is it that you're uh, you're going to be needing in order to uh, to fill in your business model canvas. And the reason why a business model canvas is important, we said that the business plan is important for funding and for more um, strategic growth for a business. A business model canvas is actually important for anybody who wants to open a business, regardless of the size. If it's a side hustle, if it's it's, you know, your full time thing, it doesn't matter. I still always, always, always recommend that you start by building in your business model canvas. The first section of the business model canvas that uh, we're going to talk about is your customer segmentation. And, you know, a lot of the times we get super excited about our business ideas and we jump right in and we try to open it right away. But what I recommend is that we start to think strategically and we start thinking about who our customers are are going to be and be very strategic and intentional about that because at the end of the day when you try to speak to everybody or to sell to everybody you're not really speaking to anyone or you're not it's going to be very hard to sell to people so you have to be very intentional and very strategic about who your customers are going to be and we need to start segmenting um, the demographics that you want to attract so I'm going to give you some examples of some um, specific customer segmentation. So you can segment your audience or your ideal client by age, by gender, by specific hobbies or interests, uh, where are they located, their cultural background, um, some of their interests, so on and so forth. And why this is important is because the more you know about your ideal client, the more intentional you become about who your ideal client is, it's going to be much easier to find them. It's going to be much easier to create messaging and marketing campaigns that are going to target specifically those types of customers. So if you go on your workbook, um, you're going to have a complete questionnaire and lots of questions in there to help you really understand who is the ideal client that you want to go to. And now, 
This is where a lot of people start asking, well, Carla, if I segment my customer into a very small, specific type of individual, um, does that mean that I'm actually going to, um, you know, to take out of the picture the rest of the demographic? And my answer is not necessarily. But um, what I definitely recommend is that you really focus on that one particular client, one particular individual or group of individuals, so that you're very intentional on how you're going to sell to them. And then, uh, but it doesn't mean that this other part of the population will not buy from you. So that they will organically, but it's just a way for you to really focus your messaging and focus it, the, the product or the service that you're providing to a particular ideal demographic. So things, again, such as age range, you know, what career jo or jobs, what are their favorite movies? Like we, we can even get so specific. And when you really think about it, uh, I'm going to put Lululemon, you know, the, the yoga wear company. When you start thinking about who is their ideal demographic, you can probably picture her because it's usually a female or at least we we um, we associate Lululemon with a, a, a female. Um, and then you start thinking about, OK, what would be their ideal client? OK, so she probably is a female. She probably looks a certain way, loves yoga. She probably drinks, you know, uh, matcha lattes. Um, so you start getting an idea of what their ideal client demographic is like. But that doesn't mean that, you know, a mom of two kids um, is not uh, going to, you know, to be their customer as well. Why? Because I like the comfort of their leggings. But uh, so that doesn't mean that, that uh, you know, I'm not going to be their target demo. Uh, actually, I'm not their target demo, but I'm still going to buy from them. Why? Because uh, I just enjoy wearing their leggings. But most of their advertising, most of their messaging, it really is targeted to a very specific demographic. So that's exactly what I suggest that you start thinking about. Start thinking about who is your ideal target demo? What do they look like? What do they sound like? Um, what is their age? And you can have more than one, uh, particularly if you're a product-based company. You can have your particular or your specific ideal clients. Um, it could be actually a consumer, direct directly the consumer. But then your uh, perhaps your other ideal client. It could potentially be let's say you're you're manufacturing beaded earrings. So your client could be you know the end consumer who wears your beaded earrings. But then a secondary client could be boutiques or gift shops, or, you know, purchasing managers from these boutique shops. So it, you know, and you can see right away how different those two customer segments would be, but it would be very important for you to list, okay, what are the kinds of boutiques that you're looking for? Okay, and then start giving it shape and start giving it more detail on what those specific clients would ideally look like. So um, right now, what I would love for you to do would be to Take a look at the worksheet, um, the workbook that um, accompanies this this workshop, and start going through the pro a customer profile questionnaire, and it will help you define your target ideal customer. So again, just go back to your workbook and um, and try to answer as many questions as possible for the specific target demographics that you're trying to reach. Now, moving on to the second portion of the business model canvas, it's discovering your unique value proposition. And this is super important. Sometimes we kind of forget about it. It's basically deciding, making an intentional decision of what is going to differentiate you, your service, or your product from the competition. And this can be very hard when... Um, when there is a there's a lot of competitors out there, it, this this can be this can be tricky. But what is unique about what you're selling? What is unique about what you're offering? And there's very the very different ways to um, to figure out that uniqueness. And my recommendation would be to take a look at who your competitors are and what are they doing right now. And how, I mean, you obviously you're not going to copy your competitors. That, that's not what I mean. I'm just, I'm just saying, take a look at who your competitors are, perhaps do a Google search and see who your direct competitors are. And then 
take a look at what they're doing and how you can do it differently. How can you add your secret sauce, your special flavor to it that is going to set you apart from your competition? Perhaps what are your strengths? What are you really, really good at? Again, that is going to be um, something different and something unique from your competitors. One thing that I would caution everybody is do not dif- or try not to differentiate yourself by being the cheapest or the most affordable. Um, it's really hard to increase your pricing um, after a while if that is what you are going to be, um, you know, differentiating yourself from your competitors. I honestly wholeheartedly believe that your uh, whatever product service um, you are selling, there is a lot of value to it. So I would discourage people to differentiate themselves by being the cheapest. I would encourage you to find a different um, unique selling proposition or, 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 or added value that you provide, perhaps is faster customer service or faster delivery, or perhaps is, you know, using um, different manu- uh, different ingredients uh, that are organic or gluten-free. And I'm just, you know, thinking um, uh, on the spot right now. But really try to see what's going to be your unique value proposition that is not associated with discounting your prices. Um, Super important. This is something that I always, always recommend. And think beyond just becoming the cheapest. Let's see what what other unique things you can add to your product or your services that is going to differentiate it from your competitors. Um, And again, there is a section in the workbook where you can actually start brainstorming about what is unique and different uh, in your business or your product. And these are some unique uh, selling proposition examples. You know, as I mentioned, it's gluten-free bakery. Uh, Maybe if you want to open a catering company, it could be a very specific catering, you know, catering to yachts or catering to schools or catering, something that's going to be super, super unique to you and to what you, um, you offer. Uh, perhaps you want to become a health coach. There's tons of, you know, health coaching um, out in the world. But what about if you become a health coach to uh, senior citizens or to specific demographics? Um, I remember there was a client of mine that I work with and she wanted to open a hair salon. And um, and I was like, OK, so how are you going to differentiate yourself uh, as a hair salon? And she's like, you know what? I think I'm going to differentiate myself by... Um, only focusing on doing um, uh, hair uh, hair drying, and her uh, salon is actually it's actually called you know just hair drying. That's the name of the salon. So she's targeting a very specific demographic. She's targeting, you know, professional women that are busy, that they just want to go in and out. They're not interested in like the hair coloring, hair cutting. They're just interested in a really good blowout um, in and out. And, uh, and, and that's all they want. So this particular client was very clear about her demographic. Her demographic was people that were busy, women that were busy, that had long hair, obviously, that wanted to be in and out and were not interested in anything else other than a good blowout. Um, and her unique selling proposition is that that's you know she like narrowed into the specific thing that makes her unique and then that's what she started selling so I encourage you to to start thinking about you know what is unique about your product what is unique about your service that will make you stand out from your competitors there we go if it wasn't clear (laughs) make sure that your business stands out how is it going to stand out and you know it doesn't have to be groundbreaking it can be as simple as um, you know, we're going to be the friendliest courier company uh, out there or delivery company out there, or we're going to be, um, you know, providing very uh, organic and gluten free, so on and so forth. But anything um, that you can think of that is going to make your business stand out, super important um, to make sure that you are standing, um, standing out from your competitors. Okay, so moving on, the the third square, and again, um, you will have. Hopefully, you will you were able to print out the uh, business model canvas. So again, this ninth square. So we're going on the third square, which is uh, it talks about cl- uh, about channels. And what I mean about channels is um, it's twofold. 
Channel number one is how do how are you going to acquire your clients? How are you going to how are, are the potential clients, you know, your the ones that you did research on, how are they gonna find out about your product or your service or yourself? And then the second fold of the two-fold approach is how are you going to deliver the service, the product, or whatever it is that you're selling to them? So let's go in. As I mentioned, there's two channels. I got ahead of myself and there's a slide. So again, the acquisition channel. So how are you going to first encounter and entice your customers to come to you? And then the second time or the second part of the channel is how are you physically going to provide the benefits to your customers? And, uh, you know, in terms of how will you acquire your customers, the examples, let me see if I have your, okay, no. So you're going to brainstorm your acquisition strategy. And if you go into the workbook, the workbook actually has a list, you know, of brainstorm ideas for you. They're not the only ones that you can do or that you can choose, but it could be, you know, how how are they going to find out of you uh, about you? Can they find about you through community and local publications or through a blog or through social media, you know, organic social media reach? paid ads reach, or it could be through networking and uh, word of mouth. Uh, it could be referral. So I have provided actually a pretty extensive list of ideas on how to acquire your customers. You know, what are some of the different ways that you can acquire? Because guess what? Social media is not the only way. Um, there's many different ways that you can uh, that you can bring in attention to your business. And again, that's why I decided to um, to create this extensive, extensive list of different ways to acquire your customers. Now, the second, uh, the second approach is how will you deliver the service or the product? How, how are, are you actually going to provide that service or product to your customers? And some ideas, it could be you're going to provide the, the service face-to-face. -face. Let's say if you're providing a service, if you're a coach, um, so on and so forth, if you're uh, a, an instructor or a tutor, it's going to be face-to-face. -face. But guess what? It could also be through a website um, or it could be through an Etsy shop. And the the idea here is for you to really sit down and be strategic about that because you can deliver, usually, you can deliver your product or your service in more than one way. You can deliver it in person, you can deliver it in person or online, you can do it through, uh, if you have a product-based company, you can sell because that's how you're delivering the product. You can sell through a retail store. You can do it through pop-up events. You can do it through wholesale partners. And the idea here is not just to list that, but, um, but to actually specify who. Who is a potential wholesale partner? Or if you're doing an event, where? Like, what are those events? And let's start doing the research and really dig deeper so that you start really forming your plan of all of the different um, uh, places that you're going to go and deliver your products to or try to deliver your products to. So again, try to go through the workbook. You have to be as specific as possible. Um, uh, and, and this workbook is actually going to help you create that strategy. Now, the fourth square uh, or the fourth lesson on the business model canvas is relationships with your customers. And this kind of sounds a little, hmm, you know, I, I never really thought about that. And basically, this is where I recommend entrepreneurs to really sit down and be I, I, I'm overusing this word strategic. So where they really think and be intentional about how you are going to relate with your customers hear me out. So this is basically where you are going to describe the relationships that you're going to that you're going to have with your customers from the moment that they become aware of your business. Okay? So that let's say you put out a Facebook ad and they become aware of your business and then they and then what? And then what happens? Right? So this is basically mapping uh, what I want is mapping your customer's journey. So you need to really figure out what is the journey from the moment that they become aware of you? So they become aware of you through, let's just say, a Facebook post. And then what? You have to give them a call to action to visit the website. Okay, so they have to go, they, they go onto the website. And then once they go onto the website, what happens? You make it easy for them to purchase. So let's say they purchase. And then what happens? Do you send them an email? Um, do they get a phone call? 
Um, you know, do they get a follow-up? Do they get, you know, just mapping that experience from beginning to end. And then the most important thing for me, oh, let's not go up. The most important thing for me that I find that a lot of people end up missing they're really good at mapping the journey of, you know, what happens at the beginning when they become aware of your business, then, you know, they purchase from you and then you send them the product or you deliver the service. But then what happens at the end? What happens after all of that has been done? You know, and, and that's an opportunity. So mapping the what happens after is an opportunity to wow them. So let's say they bought from you uh, and you... I don't know, part of the onboarding process was for them to give you their birthday and um, they buy from you. But then all of a sudden you have some information in your hands where you can actually wow them on their birthday. You can send them a happy birthday um, email. Uh, You can give them a happy birthday email coupon discount uh, or discount coupon. And uh, or, you know, you can send them a note. Uh, You know, what what is that customer journey from beginning? But don't forget about the end after they have purchased from you, how are we gonna wow them so that they continue to return to you, they continue to be customers, and they continue to actually, you know, refer business to you as well. So wowing those customers, not just from beginning to purchase, but but from beginning, purchase, and after purchase. So again, in your workbook, I have um, an exercise that will get your creative juices going to, to figure out, you know, what that customer journey is going to look like for your own customers. Now that we talked about and, you know, we, we, we know what our clients look like. We know what makes our business unique. We know how we're going to attract our customers, how we're going to deliver our service and what type of relationships and the journey that they're going to go through when, when they reach us and when we provide the service. But now what I want you to really think about is I want you to think about revenue streams. And that means money. So how are you going to make money? And at the end of the day, a business is not a business until it has money coming in, right? And what I always recommend is that aim for multiple ways of making money. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, we all love to make money, hopefully. Um, And, but, you know, A lot of the times I find that some entrepreneurs, they think of one way of making money, but they're leaving a lot of, you know, ideas on the table of making money a different way or in in addition to the traditional way of making money. So don't just rely on one source of income. And what I mean with this is, say, for example, you have a food product, right? You're, you're, let's say you have a, um, let's say you, you, you have a gluten-free bakery or you make gluten-free products and that's your unique selling, pro- um, your unique, unique selling proposition. Uh, and then, you know, how are you going to make money? So you can make money, I would say three different ways. And this is, and then I'm just thinking about them. So One way is to sell directly to your consumers, right? So maybe in a farmer's market, you're selling directly to your consumers. Maybe another way would be through uh, an e-commerce site. You know, you can create um, gift baskets uh, through e-commerce or you can create, um, uh, you know, like seasonal, you know, Christmas and Valentine's Day and whatnot. Uh, gluten-free treats and so for you know customers from around everywhere to actually be able to buy from you via e-commerce so you have your in-person pop-up events then you've got your e-commerce but then I would I would encourage you to think even further than that so what is another way to make money if you have a gluten-free bakery or a bakery or any food product would be wholesaling it so what are other avenues that you can place your products or where can you place them Is there an opportunity to place them in a local coffee shop? Or is there an opportunity to sell them to a local um, to a local retail location that sells natural health food products? You know, because that would be a great partnership there that would be interested in gluten free items. Um, so if you're beating earrings, which by the way, this, these are awesome earrings from a Mi'kmaq artist uh, in Newfoundland. Um, if you are selling beading earrings, you can sell them via you know. Um, uh, powwow. So you can sell them via 
um, you know, to your friends and to your family and like in person, but then you can also have your e-commerce side, but then there's also an opportunity to sell to retailers, right? To boutiques, to gift shops um, that can do the selling for you. And hopefully that would buy in bigger quantities than just the one-offs. So again, I would encourage um, you to go into the workbook. There is an exercise on revenue streams. Again, let's try to think about as many ways to make money as possible because I can guarantee you there's always more than one way. But I will caution you, you, you um, to one thing though, is that at the beginning, if you're just starting out, maybe just focus on two because you're probably going to go like, woo, you know, the sky's the limit. I can make money everywhere or any type. Um, but at the beginning, when you're just starting out, Let's just focus on two, right? Focus on one and two um, until you feel a little bit more comfortable with both. Then we can start adding different ways, different revenue streams and different ways of making money. But if you're just starting out, there's going to be the, um, the, the, the the automatic way of making money. That And I'm sure you already know, oh, yeah, this is easy. This is exactly how I'm going to make money. But then I'm going to challenge you to think of what's another revenue stream? What's another way? that could potentially open a, a different market or a different way of making money. So I always, always, always encourage to think of at least two ways and then start with those two. And then as you start feeling comfortable with those two, then you can start adding more, um, more revenue streams. Okay. There we go. So brainstorm your revenue streams. Just go back to the workbook and the workbook should um, provide a little bit more guidance and more uh, you know, questions that will get your creative juices going. Now the sixth uh, square is what are your startup costs and your ongoing expenses? Because yes, my friend, unfortunately, you know, just as much as you're going to be making money, you're going to be spending money to get your business up and running and uh, and to continue your business open. So at the end of the day, this is where you really want to brainstorm, you know, what are those so those common startup costs if you're just starting your business or if you have a business already? What are those ongoing costs that you really need to think about? And I put over here, um, there, <laughs> I put over there examples of what are some common, um, common st startup costs and ongoing costs, which could be business registration. If you're just starting, how much is that going to cost? Equipment, insurance, inventory, website, domain. Um, if you are uh, delivering stuff yourself, you know, how much is gas going to cost on average? So the idea for this part um, is to list them, but then also to do the research and find out approximately how much that's going to cost, right? Because you want to get a, a, a very good idea of if you're just at the startup phase, how much is it going to cost you really to start that business and see if you have um, the finances for that? Or B, um, if you have a, a business that's already open, you know, realistically, how much is it going to cost you to just keep it open, just to pay the bills um, to to keep the business open? And you really have to be intentional uh, and do the research and really find out, the spe uh, be as specific as possible when it comes to um, the numbers and cents for how much everything is going to cost. Yeah, that's going to take a little bit of more time to do. And sometimes it's a bit like, you know, this part is like the part that we kind of, oh, we don't really want to say, we don't really want to find out, but we kind of have to just to make sure that we go in with our eyes open and we know, you know, if our monthly costs are going to be, you know, a thousand dollars, then that means how much do I have to sell in order to pay for my, you know, my everyday costs. So again, in terms of your costs, um, you want to be as specific as possible and to really think about all of the different things that you need to pay for to keep the business going. Okay, here we go. So ongoing expenses. Sorry, I, I can't see my my presenter's notes. So I'm that's why I'm I'm overstating myself over and over because I can't see what the next slide is. But yeah, so you have your ongoing expenses, and what if you can't find if you can't afford your startup costs? You know, then you can if if you realize that the startup costs are huge, um, then start thinking about well, what can I do without? 
Or how can I find the funds to make it happen? Are there any pitch competitions that I could apply for? Um, hint, hint. Um, or are there any friends and family that could help, you know, with a loan? Or are there any um, funding programs that you can apply for? But I, again, in order for you to make that decision, you need to go back to the drawing board and really list all of the potential expenses that you will encounter. All right, so, oh, and again, in the workbook, the worksheet, I've made an exercise where um, I give you some ideas on what are some of those common costs and ongoing expenses, uh, where you itemize them and then you um, you put the cost next to it so that you really, really take a, a look at the scope of the, of the cost of that. The next uh, square in your business model canvas is gonna be key resources. And what I mean about key resources is what are those things that you need in order to provide the service or the product that you're going to provide. So it could be, you know, what are those, those things that you really, really must have? Because if you don't have that, you're not gonna be able to, to, to sell to sell what you need to sell. You know, some businesses, they rely heavily on their website because they're an e-commerce site. So a key resource is their website. Or it can be perhaps different materials. Or if you are a manufacturer or a crafter, your key resources are going to be your the materials that you use in order to create what you're going to sell. It could be a camera. If you're a photographer, you know, a key resource is going to be your camera equipment, is going to be your editing software, um, and it's going to be perhaps your car is going to be a key resource because you're going to need that car in order to provide that service, maybe, depending on, on the type of photography that you're doing. Um, if you have a, um, you know, a store, let's say you have a retail location, so your key resources obviously is going to be your inventory. Um, and it sounds very simple, but some Sometimes as you start thinking about what those key resources will be, you'll realize that it's more than you thought they would be. So again, I would highly recommend you really put some thought into it because again, it could be, it could also be staff. You know, if you are providing tutoring services, let's say you're, let's say you're a, a math tutor. So your key resources, physically, you don't really have a lot of key resources when you're tutoring, perhaps your books, you know, if you're following a specific method, uh, perhaps, um, obviously, maybe a website, you know, so that people are able to find you. But some, probably your key resource is going to be staff. It's going to be maybe another tutor. Um, it's going to be yourself, obviously, but perhaps it's going to be staff so that you're able to provide more services for more people. So again, key resources, they don't necessarily have to be tangible. They can, uh, sorry, intangible, sorry, like the website and whatnot, they can be tangible like inventory, but they can also be human resources if that is what you are providing. Um, you know, staff definitely is going to be, is going to be key. If you, for example, if you want to open a restaurant, key resources definitely are going to be your chef or your cooks or uh, the staff that help you, you know, serve, so on and so forth. That's definitely a key resource because without them, um, you know, the, the, you wouldn't be able to provide or sell what you're selling. So again, list all of the physical, virtual, digital, and human resources that you need in order to get this business going. And second last square, <laughs> second last uh, section in the business model canvas is your key activities. And by key activities is basically all of the tasks that must be completed for the customers to be served. And again, it's very similar to mapping your customer journey, but map all of the key activities that you need to do in order to serve your customers. And what do I need? Oh, sorry. And what do I need, uh, you know, mean about this? It can be 
Um, you know, what are some of the key activities that you need? Perhaps sales call, um, updating your website. And this is basically just a brain dump that you need to do. Um, workshop, like let's say you're you're an instructor. Okay, so the key activities are going to be developing the workshop and delivering the workshop. It could be coaching calls. It could be meal preparation, if that's what you're into. It could be manufacturing the product or writing reports or, you know, let's start thinking about all of the different key activities activities that you must do in order to keep the business going or in order to serve the community that you're serving with your business. So the workbook has a section where, you know, it allows you to do that brain dump that I just told, uh, told you about um, specifically for your business. And last, but certainly not least, um, it's the key partners and partnerships. This one's actually really important. Um, Usually, okay, let me just go back here. Usually the key activities, these are going to be the key activities that come naturally to you. This is basically what you're really good at. If you are a, you know, if you are a baker and you love baking or a cook and you love cooking or, um, you know, whatever key activity that you are really good at, these are usually going to be the key activities that you're going to put in here. Um, because it's the, the activities that basically at the end of the day, you know, you do in order to have a business, right? And usually, usually are activities that you are really good at. And these are the activities that you monetize. Now, in terms of key partners and partnerships, um, these are activities. Here we go. Um, so in terms of the key partners, who are the key partners and why do you need them to create value? Now, these key partnerships are usually people and organizations that are going to take some of the responsibility off your shoulders. And usually your key partners are you are people that will do stuff that you necessarily are not good at or that you a lot of the times don't like doing, and you're going to outsource that to others. What do I mean by this? So let's say, um, you know, let's say you're in manufacturing and um, you're really busy with the manufacturing process, but with a manufacturing company or a manufacturing business of any type, any type of manufacturing, um, the, the manufacturing is in the selling is what takes most of the time that sometimes the bookkeeping, the accounting, you know, all of that stuff kind of gets left behind because it's stuff that, and I'm generalizing here. Let's say, let's talk about with my experience. That's the stuff that I don't like, <laughs> uh, but I understand that's very important and it must get done. You know, you, I need to have my books up to up uh, up to date, and I need to make sure that I'm recording and that I don't end up with, you know, a shoebox full of receipts at the end of the year that I have to struggle with. So then, my key partner would be somebody that I could outsource that to, so that it doesn't fall through the cracks. So yes, a bookkeeper is my, you know, saving grace and is one of my preferred key partners um, so that they're able to take off those activities that I don't necessarily enjoy doing, that I'm not necessarily good at. At the beginning, when you're starting your business, you're probably doing all of this yourself and it's totally understandable. But once you start seeing that some of that work gets you know, falling through the cracks, it's perhaps a good idea for you to start thinking about uh, your key partners. You know, what are those people that you're going to involve in your business to offload some of that work? And that's why we want to do this right now when you're starting your business. Um, you have to be conscientious eventually about, um, about who you need to involve, whether it is right now or perhaps six months from now or a year from now. Uh, what are some of those activities that you don't necessarily enjoy and that perhaps you're going to be uploading. So start thinking about all of those people. Um, start thinking it could be bookkeepers. It could be social media managers if that's not your 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 gist. Uh, it could be web developers if that's not your gist. So again, what are those key partners, um, people or organizations that will be able to help you take off uh, your shoulders, those responsibilities that need to happen in order for you to keep your business going? Now, that's one part of the key partnerships, right? Is the stuff that you're going to offload. But the other section or the other part of a key partnership is what are those partnerships 
that you can collab with that will help you expand the reach of your business. You know, usually it's like non-competing partnerships, obviously. Uh, so what are those organizations? Is there an, or, an organization that you can think of that could potentially support you to expand your business? Adaway or Adawe, sorry. Adawe should be in your business uh, canvas as an organization, a partner organization to help you with your business. But, you know, what are other organizations uh, out there to help you? What are other businesses that could potentially be a good partnership to join? So start brainstorming about all of the different partnerships, the people that you can offload work to, uh, perhaps not now, but maybe in the future. It's good to think about it right now, but then also start thinking about those key partners uh, and partnerships that you can create in order to expand your business. And again, it doesn't mean that you're going to contact them right now, contact them right now. It just means that you are being strategic, you know, about the creation of your business or the expansion of your business if you already have one. And you just want to do a brain dump of all of those potential partnerships. Again, the workbook has um, a section for you to, um, to do that brainstorm. And my friends, we are now finished with the business model canvas. So again, we talked about, oops, sorry here. I don't know what's going on with all the paperwork here. So we are going to put it all together. It's uh, basically, um, we talked about, actually, let me go back to my trusty, trusty page. We talked about your customer segments. Who are they? What do they lo look like? Is it more than one ideal customer? It could be. Then we talk about our value proposition. You know, what makes our business unique? What makes us separate from our competitors? And then we talk about channels. How are we going to attract potential customers to our business? And then, but then how are we going, what channel we're going to use to deliver our product or our service? Then we talk about customer relationships. How are we going to map that customer journey and how do we want our relationship with our customers be? Is it going to be personal? Are we going to send notes? Uh, how are we going to get in touch with them after we deliver the service or the product? Um, and really mapping that journey. Then we talk about startup costs or ongoing expenses and really digging into that research and making sure that we are as specific as possible. Uh, then we talk about uh, key resources and basically what are the operational needs of your business? You know, what what do you need in order to keep your business going in terms of materials, people, um, inventory, so on and so forth? Then we talk about the key activities. You know, what are those activities that you must do? To, in order to keep your business going. It's going to be selling. It's going to be updating your website. It's going to be um, uh, creating the products. It's going to be doing digital marketing. So all of the key activities that you can think of. Again, it's like that brain dump happening. And last but not least, uh, we talked about the key partnerships that we're going to develop. First partnership would be um, those people that we're going to offload stuff that we're not necessarily good at. And then the second partnership, um, we're going to create a list of potential partners that will help us expand our business. You know, those collabs um, or those people that are going to be um, beneficial so that our business expands as much as possible. So that's it, my friends. Hopefully that was helpful to you guys. Um, again, don't forget to print, download and print your workbook um, it is really helpful to go through it. The beauty about the business model canvas, you know, it looks like this. The beauty about the business model canvas is that it doesn't have to be a static document. And that's why I've included a couple of these because you can print as many as you want. And if you find that something that you have planned over here doesn't work, just delete it or get a new copy and uh, and add something else you know that the idea is for this document to be a living document and a changing document because at the end of the day business is never a straight line you know it's like a it's more like a roller coaster <laughs> uh, and when something doesn't go well or when something doesn't work then you have you know 
you have a quick reference where you can go, you know what, this didn't work, but what can I do instead? Okay, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to change it to this instead. Uh, but this is this is always good to keep, you know, visible to keep somewhere in your computer so that you always look at it. And if you find that something is not working, you um, change it right away and you try something new again. Business is never linear. It's never a straight line, unfortunately. There's a lot of twists and turns, uh, but hopefully the business model canvas will help you to have a more fun ride, <laughs> going with the puns, um, uh, and, and will be able to help you in your journey. So hopefully this was helpful, my friends. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, there is the business model canvas. And there we go. That's me again. So thank you so much. Hopefully this helped. And if uh, you have any questions, feel free to reach out or feel free to reach out to the folks at Adawe. They are going to be super important in your journey as an entrepreneur. And hopefully you will take advantage of their services. Take care. <music>